You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. Well, let's just start with this. Andrew, uh, I will apologize on behalf of all uh, for the performance, no. the communication, <laughs> the, the course of seven. It was probably because right before we came on, I was reading a story about uh, uh, no, about Aaron Rodgers potentially don't. becoming oh, vice president. <laughs> And, uh, you know, the good news, elections on a Tuesday, that's normally player's day off. Right. So he'd be available (laughs) to watch, you know, the results roll in. There it is. is. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Let's say, all right, go back like five years. Mm -hmm. And let's say you just had a mad lib of something I'd be tweeting on the second day of free agency. How about Robert F. Kennedy has recently approached Jets quarterback Aaron Rodgers, Jets quarterback, Mm -hmm. and Jesse the Body Ventura (laughs) about serving as his running mate on an independent president. Ticket and both have welcomed the overtures, according to the New York Times. Jesse Ventura elected Minnesota governor when I was a senior in high school, and all my idiot 18-year-old friends were like, yeah, Jesse the body, this is funny, let's vote for him, and he won. So don't laugh, don't laugh at the idea of Aaron Rodgers as vice president. This is one of those George Costanza driving to the Poconos moments Mm -hmm. where it's like, I'm really going to go be vice president. Anything can happen, Andrew. I mean, back to you, frenzy. Let's go. As as long as he's not Surgeon he's General, I, I I can't wait for the <laughs> for the for the off season topic bar. Very nice. Uh, talking about not touching that one was and Aaron Rodgers <laughs> run for VP and lead the Jets to the playoffs. That's coming up next. But it's not like a VP does that much anyway. Better have a lot of victory Mondays. Big campaign stump day. Uh, Kamala taking strays out here. So apparently this is a thing. It's just a question of how real of a thing is this? Because I've been going back and forth on this. My initial thought was even if we assume that the reports are true that he was approached, there's no way he would accept it because he's the current quarterback of the New York Jets. And all he would, although he'd be the VI, uh, the VP, VIP, there you go, MVP, whatever. Although he'd be the VP candidate of a guy that has no chance of winning, it would still run through the NFL season. So how would that work? Essentially, he would have to, first of all, get permission to even seek this. But second of all, he would have to n- presumably not be the quarterback unless it's like, no, it won't interfere. But could you imagine? I mean, that is like... Everything Packer fans got annoyed with, as far as Rodgers maybe not being fully invested and fully committed. Can you imagine if you were running as VP while you're supposed to be, you know, training to win a Super Bowl? You know, you're supposed to be going to practice instead of doing debate prep. <laughs> but the bottom line, it's, it's so in the back of my mind, okay, this, this is obviously just something stupid. Like he approached Rodgers, maybe, maybe that didn't even happen. But he approached Rodgers, and I'm sure Rodgers said, you know, I'll think about it or whatever, and he has no intention of doing it. But then I thought about it, and I'm like, you know, you're Aaron Rodgers. You want that next great thing, right? You made it to the NFL. You, you became starting quarterback. You won MVP. You won a Super Bowl. You became part owner of a sports franchise. You're a you know, multi-hundred millionaire, dated celebrities and superstars. What what's next? What else? What are what what else is there? And we all assumed it would be you know he's gonna head off into the mountains somewhere and just go do nothing. But he's kind of been setting himself up for something a little bit different. For example, he's been a much more public voice, voicing his opinion. He's specifically aligned himself with a political candidate. Who's to say he isn't 
sort of jockeying for a future career in politics. Now, maybe that's just some third party, quasi Green Party thing going on. I don't know. I can't imagine him aligning with either of the two major parties. I don't know. I just find it interesting to think about. Because when you, when you stop and think for a second, even, you know, f- leave aside this year, you can kind of see it where it's like, oh, yeah, maybe, you know, whether intentionally or not, he's been kind of laying some groundwork to be able to enter maybe things more publicly as opposed to less publicly, which I think many of us thought would be the direction he would go when he left football. I'm also excited because I had mentioned many times, as much as everyone's like, oh, good, the drama's gone. I, as a podcaster, I'm sad that the Rodgers drama's gone. And here we go. Rodgers potential VP candidate. We're back in action, baby. <laughs> in other news, it was reported by Tom Silverstein that essentially the Packers are more or less done in free agency. Um, he says that unless the prices or a lesson until the prices come down, and meet the value that they find to be more reasonable for the guys that are out there, they're just not seeing any value in free agency right now. And that is not because they don't have money. They actually have plenty of money. According to Silverstein, they should have around 25 to $30 million still left over. Now, I've never really seen this before. One of the things I've been telling people on social media is when the Packers have money, they spend money. They just generally don't have it. So this is not some unprecedented thing. We just never have this kind of... In other words, it's not unprecedented in terms of them actually dabbling in free agency or signing a big player, it's unprecedented in terms of them actually having money. So if they carry 25 to $30 million into the season, which they won't because they got to sign their own guys or whatever, but they're still going to carry a lot more than normal, say 15 to $20 million, that would be really unusual. Now, we can assume that maybe there's one more signing here or there coming in, maybe a linebacker or whatever, but he says that it's possible that they just carry some of the excess into next year. Now, personally, I think this is a good idea. He talks about the fact that, you know, right now we're doing pretty well as far as, you know, money goes, but we got a lot of contracts coming up. And not only do we have contracts, but we got some big money that's about to hit. So, for example, we're going to be paying Jordan Love this year. There's presumably going to be a really big spike in how much that's going to cost starting next year. We're going to need the more the money more next year than we're going to need it this year. So I'm all on board with... uh, going ahead and stashing some away. We'll see how it goes, but that is his reporting. Presumably, this is coming from inside of Green I don't know why else he would say it, coming from inside of Green Bay, that as of right now, uh, the prices are just too high. We'll see what happens as they start to drop, if some people start to make a little bit more sense. But that isn't to say that some things are happening, so let's uh, just do a couple of the updates here. First of all, pretty big news. I For whatever reason, I don't know if I dreamed it or what, Um, maybe it was just a rumor that the, the Vikings were trying to bring Hunter back on a contract. I remember seeing something in passing and just thinking, here we go again. You know, there's all this work up about these guys are leaving and they're not going anywhere. Well, Daniil Hunter was signed by the Houston Texans. All I can say to Kirk Cousins and Daniil Hunter is good riddance. Best of luck to you with Houston. They're a good football team out there, even though I got freaking eviscerated on my... (laughs) NFL Draft YouTube channel by Texans fans. That's all right. They'll come around eventually. Broke the cardinal sin of being honest as opposed to buttering up the the franchise, and I I should know better. But a two-year, $49 million deal, it's really not bad at all. I mean, 25 million bucks, uh, you know, he's still making a living out there for sure. I don't know the contract details beyond that, but um, that's pretty good money. I know on the 12th, Corey Ballantyne signed a contract. I don't really know anything beyond that. He wasn't going anywhere. Um, Tyler Davis officially signed his contract since Wednesday's the first actually official day. But he signed a one-year, essentially $1 million contract. Baltimore did trade their right tackle, Morgan Moses, to the Jets, basically for peanuts. Tells you more or less what they think of him, but I believe they swapped fourth-round picks and then got a sixth. The Ravens also released pass rusher Tyus Bowser, so he'll be available. Jordan Whitehead, the strong safety, signed a two-year deal with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, so if you're considering him, he is now no longer available. Mike Williams was released by the LA Chargers. That was an expected move. However, they're also right now expected to re-sign him. So for anybody interested in Mike Williams, it's not a done deal. Anything can happen, but it does look like he potentially is going back to the Chargers just on a lesser deal. Uh, Saran, Saran Neal, safety for Miami, resigned, And then the 
Uh, only other note that I have so far is that the Bengals did release safety Nick Scott. Nick Scott is a strong safety, so since we're kind of on the market, anytime you see that, it kind of sets up some flags. However, uh, it should be known that Nick Scott is not a very good football player. He started off in L.A., uh, didn't really get his start until year three, had a 57 grade, uh, became a full-time starter in his fourth and final year in L.A., got a 54 grade, and then his first year in, first and only year in Cincinnati, he ended with a 44 PFF grade. His coverage grades the last two years have been 43 and 38.8. So unless they think that they could really turn this guy around by doing some stuff, I don't think it's going to be great. I mean, to be fair, it's mostly coverage he sucks at, but he sucks a lot at it. So I don't think that's a I don't think that's an option. But one of the intriguing things that has not happened yet is Justin Fields finding a new home. At least let me hit refresh on the old Twitters, make sure I'm not uh, speaking out of turn here. I don't see anything. But I want to read this little snippet here. This is from Kevin Fishbane of The Athletic. It says, could the Bears keep Justin Fields and draft Caleb Williams? Obviously, this has been speculated for some time. I just kind of like how this article starts off. It says, it didn't take long for the quarterback dominoes to start falling when the NFL's negotiation window opened on Monday. Kirk Cousins went to the Falcons. Baker Mayfield, Tampa Bay. Gardner Minshew, Las Vegas Raiders. Sam Darnold, Minnesota Vikings. Jacoby Brissett, New England Patriots. Marcus Mariota, Washington Commanders. Jameis Winston, Cleveland Browns. Many found new teams. Justin Fields, on the other hand, remains QB1 for the Chicago Bears. It goes on then to speculate. It says interpretations as to why that's the case as the league officially opens the 2024 season Wednesday will vary. It also likely depends on what you want the Bears to do at quarterback. But the hustle and bustle of the negotiation window tends to result in widespread impatience. The NFL's offseason is long. It, a lot can and will happen across the league. Quarterback Caleb Williams' pro day at USC is next Wednesday, and the, and the draft in Detroit is still more than a month away. With that in mind, let's discuss Fields' place with the Bears. So then it goes on to a new article. I'm not really interested at this point in going into that, but I, I do find it funny. So essentially, we th all thought, by we I mean not most of us, me and you listening, that Fields was a really good quarterback. He just needed a new home. He needed to go somewhere where they had a good offensive coordinator, a system that knew how to use him, and he could be a really good quarterback somewhere. And with that, half of Bears fans wanted to keep him. The other did not. But most Bears fans at least thought they could get something that was um, resembling what you would call a haul for Justin Fields. I was seeing some Bears fans speculate about first-round picks or possibly trading them to move up uh, their second first-round pick to a, you know, maybe to number three or something if they trade Fields or just something a little bit higher. And so you see in the article, it says, hey, I mean, Fields hasn't been, uh, all these other guys go and Fields didn't. But it says, but we need to learn to be patient. We're so impatient at this time of year. There's a lot that goes on. There's a lot of reasons. It doesn't have to mean Fields is bad at stuff. I mean, come on. After all, Caleb Williams' pro day at USC is next Wednesday. And Ian Rappaport had also touched on that. Here is Ian Rappaport. Um, doing the same song and dance, essentially running interference for Justin Fields and uh, and his agent, probably. Yeah. So here's where the Bears, what the Bears are doing right now, and I know a lot of talk has been about Justin Fields. This is not a Justin Fields discussion. Yes, it is. This is a Caleb Williams number one overall pick discussion. No, it's not. But the Chicago Bears are committed to doing, and really what they have been committed to doing uh, the entire time is fully evaluating the quarterbacks who they could take at number one, including Caleb Williams. They were at the Combine. They met with him there. They are going to be in full force at Caleb Williams' pro day uh, a week from tomorrow. They are going to have him to the facility to visit with him. They're going to do the full evaluation. And at the point when they are then settled on taking Caleb Williams' number one, which we expect, but we don't know for sure because this is too important a decision to just go, yeah, okay, we'll take this guy, we'll trade the other guy. Until all that, they're going to do the full evaluation. When they settle on a quarterback that they are taking number one, and I do expect them to take a quarterback at number one, at that point they will then move to say, where are we going to trade Justin Fields? Might this happen leading up to the draft? Sure, it could. History has shown these trades happen a lot of times leading up, like like right before the draft or sometimes during the draft. Josh Rosen got traded literally during the draft 
when I believe the Cardinals were on the clock in the second round, if I remember correctly. So that's sort of the timeline for these things. But just because they're not actively shopping him doesn't really mean anything as it pertains to Justin Field. First of all, there's so much bull crap in that, it's unbelievable. We heard directly, directly from other insiders, maybe Ian, I don't know, that the Bears are and were at least shopping Justin Fields. The other thing we heard incessantly from many Bears fans especially is that they're going to do right by Justin Fields, which means we're not going to string him along. We're going to make a decision and then we're going to act on it. If you're saying that you're refusing to shop him because we're not sure if we're taking a quarterback number one, which essentially is what we're saying, right? What else could that possibly mean? Well, we have to evaluate evaluate Caleb. For what? To see if you're doing Caleb or Justin? Well, no, maybe we'll go uh, one of the other quarterbacks. Well, then you don't need Justin Fields. The only reason you're keeping Justin Fields is because you're not sure if you're going to pick a quarterback number one. You Come on, man. You want to know what the bottom line is? Here, here's what. First of all, the agent absolutely wants this out there because he does not want anyone to believe that there's no value. But you know who else wants this? The team. The team does not want it to get out that there's no value for Justin Fields. Now, granted, a lot of teams haven't even, um, you know, been interested. They've gone in other directions. But he, but here's the thing: you're going to draft a quarterback, right? By waiting, what did you just do? You just screwed yourself out of any market because everybody that's interested in a quarterback has settled the quarterback situation. Everybody. It might not be their favorite option. The Minnesota Vikings have Sam Darnold. Guess what? They're not desperate, and they're sure as hell not desperate for getting Justin Fields. Are they they seriously going to have a Justin Fields-Sam Darnold competition? That's what they're going to do? They're going to invest in both of those piles of crap and see if any one of them can come out into something? I mean, 10 million isn't much for a quarterback, but you're going to give up 10 million for Darnold, what? So he can sit on the bench and then you're going to give up draft capital and have to pay Justin Fields on top of it? I don't think so. I think if you wanted Fields, they would have taken Fields, but they didn't. They took Darnold. Now, they can still draft somebody if that becomes available, but that's the point. If I'm going to take a swing, I'm going to take a swing. I'm not going for Fields. And a lot of other teams have done that. They settled on, on all these other guys. They don't need some backup just in case. That's what I got Jameis Winston for. That's what I got. You know, all these, the the other quarterbacks that were listed for. So the Bears have screwed themselves by not moving Justin Fields. And the bottom line is, we were told by many people that they did shop Fields and there was no market. So the bottom line is, this is damage control. This is them saying, oh, no, 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 we we weren't shopping him. We're we're doing, we're being responsible. We're doing our due diligence. And then we'll figure out what we want to do after that. The bottom line is, Bears fans, I'm sorry. Your GM is a freaking dunce and he screwed you. And he screwed Justin Fields. And he screwed your franchise. Not that this is franchise destroying, but the fact that he's this stupid and incompetent is a bit of a problem. This is a terrible look. Because as much as he was refusing to take those offers, guess what? Those offers are going to get a lot worse for Justin Fields, and this picture is going to look a lot worse. And now Fields' options are also less. You want to do right by Fields? Well, he has no choice in where he goes. Now there's very limited options into who even wants him. This is pathetic attempt at damage control because remember, these guys essentially are mouthpieces and they know that, but we need to know that too. They are insiders, but they are insiders at the behest of the people that give them the information. And where do they get their information from? Teams and agents, occasionally from players. But the bottom line is it's coming with some kind of a bent to it. Somebody's giving their perspective on things or their message. This is, this is, this is bullcrap. Again, even if it's the truth, it's stupid. There's no way that you spin this where it goes, oh, no, that actually makes a lot of sense and it's super smart. Oh, no, they're doing their due diligence on Caleb. What does that have to do with Fields? And if you're telling me it's because you're thinking of keeping them, then guess what? That dude should be fired. Brian Poles, with his cool walk and his popped collar, he and Justin Fields, who's got all the good vibes. And Bears fans, listen to me, you you got to start freaking smarting it up. And I know that this is mostly just a couple of half wits on social media. I get that. But your fan base is out of control and is embarrassing the living crap out of you. You guys are such an embarrassment the way you represent yourselves. You don't care about football. You care about vibes. You care about highlight reels. You care about the dumbest crap. Start caring about football. I'm, I'm sorry. Listen, you know, you want to know probably what, what pisses me off the most? And you've heard me talk about this. I genuinely have respect for the organization of the Chicago Bears. I know I talk trash about the Bears, the Bears, the Bears. I'm talking about the 2024, 2023, 2022, 2019, 2020 Bears. I'm talking about those guys, the organization and the players. I have no respect for them. 
The owners I don't respect. The GM I don't respect. The coach I don't respect. The players I don't respect. They all suck, and they're an embarrassment to your franchise, and you should be on my side. Bears fans should be with me on this issue because I want, actually I kind of don't because I enjoy it, but it still pisses me off to my core as a football fan, the, 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 the Bears that are worthy of respect and the fact that Bears fans don't is a joke. The fact that they're fighting for guys like Poles and they're, they're sticking up for guys like Justin Fields. You, you guys stand up for and protect the biggest piles of crap ever. Why don't you start expecting things? This is what a lot of people have been talking about with Jets fans. They're a better fan base. You know why? Because when people, ins- when people suck for the Jets, Jets fans say it. They say they suck and they want them out. And they want something better. They want a great franchise. Bears fans, what are you doing? You guys just sit around and talk about, we're going to be great, we're going to be great, we're going to be great, and you hype up all this garbage. I mean, it's like people make fun of you for living in the past. I wish you guys would live in the past more. Bro, where's my butt kiss? Where's my Urlacher? I can't do a quarterback, but you know what I mean? Like, where, where are these guys? Where's that culture? Where's that pride? Where did it go? You haven't had a team since Lovey Smith, man. No disrespect to Vic Fangio and what he did for that defense. That was a great defense, but it was just an unbelievably elite defense dragging along a team. And it was a one-year fleeting thing. I can't really give you much credit for that. You guys used to have some pride. Used to put up a fight. Used to have expectations and standards. You should want Poles gone. You you shouldn't want to keep Ryan Poles because he's got a cool strut, which he doesn't. He looks like a frumpy loser. Looks like the nerdy kid who was invited to a party and is like, doesn't know how to do it right. And he's like trying to fit in, but he definitely doesn't. Not that any of this matters because his look on the outside has nothing to do with it. What it should be is I need you to do the right thing. And the right thing is you maximize the amount that you get for Justin Fields because he's out the door. And honestly, the, the idea of keeping Fields, I think, is through the roof. If I'm him, I'm doing damage control myself. And the biggest damage control I can do is keep him. Because if you try to trade him, you're going to get pennies for the guy. And you're going to look like you squandered this because you could have got more if you'd have taken a different offer early, but instead you didn't because you thought his market was bigger than it did. You tried to overplay your hand. Everybody else went somewhere else. They got all these different quarterbacks. Now nobody wants your guy. The best play is to say, we want him here. And then when you draft somebody, you say, this is a legit competition because we know that Justin Fields is talented. He hasn't had a right shot. And you're going to get a little bit of flack for it. It doesn't matter. But the I, I just I don't know what else to do because you're going to look like an idiot. Anyways, I had to work in a Bears rant, man. I haven't done it in a while, you know. It's just, you guys, I, you got to put up with me once in a while just with this, with this stuff. You understand. But hey, here, here's the good news. I hope they trade Fields to the Vikings. Because then, I, Vikings fans, you and I are going to get to know each other a little bit. You know what I mean? Like, we're really, really going to get to know each other. <laughs> Although it'll it'll probably be different. I couldn't even get Vikings fans to like Kirk Cousins. Like, I'm trying to be mad at him, and they're like, bro, our quarterback sucks. I'm like, no, he's really good. (laughs) He's going to go to Minnesota, and Vikings fans are going to be like, dude, screw this guy. He's a freaking bum. And then I can't go at him. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Why don't we take our first break? Uh, Patreon still exists. Patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so for as little as a dollar a month. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda, you never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, price line. Ah, mmm. The first taste of rare bourbon you finally got your hands on. That's nice. At Caskers.com, we make this experience easy. 
Caskers is a one-stop spirit curator with an impressive selection of exclusive sought-after rare and household names in the realm of premium spirits and champagne. Discover the top flavors of the year now by going to caskers.com and using code WELCOME10 for $10 off your first purchase. Get $10 off your first purchase with code WELCOME10 at caskers.com. So some additional Green Bay Packers news. The Packers, according to Tom Silverstein, did not submit restricted free agent tenders for cornerback Robert Rochelle or running back Patrick Taylor. Both are free agents and can sign anywhere. It's not unthinkable that they'll return. A low tender would have cost Green Bay $2.985 million, so not surprised offers were not made. I kind of thought Patrick Taylor get signed up, but so that really relieves us down to two. And look, I, I like Emmanuel Wilson as much as the next guy. But I just don't know that the Packers are making decisions based on that. You know what I mean? It's like anytime I say something about man, we really got to go on looking at running backs. The comment inevitably comes: "Wow, nobody believes in Emmanuel Wilson." It's like, look, I've been very complimentary of Emmanuel Wilson and the way he runs. I love watching him run. But there's a lot of guys that I've loved watching run, and the Packers didn't like him, and he was gone in a year, two, three. And the reality is the Packers did not really show a s- extreme interest in Emmanuel Wilson, aside from being one of the only guys left over, and that's just because he's brand spanking new. He doesn't have a contract that ran out. Nobody was cut aside from Aaron Jones, and that was a contract dispute. And he's 30 years old. So I, I hope Emmanuel Wilson can be an absolute stud. I just have nothing to base that on. We would need to see him full-time in in some kind of a larger capacity. And even then, I'm of the opinion the Packers don't know what they have necessarily in Emmanuel Wilson. Yes, to some degree they do, but they don't know what they have in terms of his ability to be a, you know, every down. Can can he be a three down back? Can he be a guy that can carry you for a quarter? Can, you know, is that the kind of guy you have in Emmanuel Wilson or is he just kind of a change of pace back? Is he only good at some things or all things? You know, his durability, his down to down, his game to game. And so for those reasons, they have to kind of, in my mind, assume he's more of a number three and at least try to find a number two. And on top of that, again, we don't know necessarily what we're going to have in Josh Jacobs. Hopefully we paid him to be a stud, but there's no guarantee there. So I'm not trying to slight Emmanuel Wilson when I say we have to go look at running backs. I'm always of the opinion that you just never know. And I know that isn't very, uh, a very strong fandom opinion. But that's almost always going to be my opinion. Unless somebody's terrible and has always been terrible, I'm usually pretty confident that they're not going to be good. Other than that, eh, I'm pretty cautious. Anyways, um, I do want to at some point start looking at some linebacker options. I don't want to do that right this second. Um, We've been kind of in a flurry. Plus, I'm going to take Tom Silverstein at his word. If things change, then so be it. Um... His word being that, you know, they're not really interested right at this very moment, maybe a little bit later. And I want to kind of shift my attention back to the draft momentarily because a couple of the things that we've done have kind of shifted my thinking on the direction of the team. One of those things, well, actually, in a way, safety and running back both, I, I something kind of clicked. And I've talked about it before, but I want to look at that into the draft. One of them, as I said, is running back, which is you know, there's a question of, are we looking for that Aaron Jones replacement so that we kind of get that Jones-Dillon thing with Josh Jacobs being Dillon and we got to find, you know, the whatever. But I don't necessarily think so. Remember, the the Brian Gutekunst inherited Aaron Jones. And it's not to say that he didn't like Aaron Jones or whatever. It obviously worked out perfectly. But I don't know that in a perfect world, that's the kind of player that he would draft. Not saying it's out of the realm of possibility, just saying it's not his ideal running back. And so although we have Josh Jacobs, who seems to be more of a quote-unquote Dylan, I think he's still, just looking for a running back, is looking for a bigger, more durable type of guy. Remember, he did draft A.J. Dylan, who was just a freakishly massive human being. Now he's letting him go because it didn't pan out, but still, that is his flavor. Then when we get to safety... You know, there was always talk by Halfley about being able to, even even the, you know, the free safety, you think about him as being this, you know, fast, athletic cover guy. And that's all he does. That's all the free safety does. He needs to be able to get sideline to sideline, 4-2-5 speed, et cetera, et cetera. And he gets a guy with 4-6 speed that is an elite tackler. That's the free safety. Now, I still hate the free safety, strong safety designation 
because we've been told for so long that that's basically been erased from from football. It should be erased from our vernacular. Essentially, you've got two safeties. They're interchangeable. They're just safeties, et cetera, et cetera. But there is a bit of a distinction, seemingly, in what Halfley does between, you know, his free safety and his strong safety, whatever term, use whatever terminology you like, post safety, whatever, I don't care. And so the only thought that I have is if, if that guy, Xavier McKinney, is what he wants in a free safety, I'm assuming he needs to be that and more as a strong safety. It's probably going to be somewhat of a similar guy, right? We know that speed isn't necessarily a massive thing. If the guy runs a 4 6 five, well, so does our free safety. So I don't think that's a problem. He has to at least be as good of a tackler as Xavier McKinney, which is an unbelievably high bar. And so that's kind of my starting point for this next safety that we're looking for. And so I want to explore some of the prospects and just kind of go through some of the things that, um, you know, again, these are not hard disqualifying things, but maybe just guys that kind of catch my eye as being um, maybe what I envision they're looking for, best way I can think to put it. So let's go through this list real quick of the just really fast. And and again, this is is sort of a lazy man's approach, but I don't think it's a terrible approach because some of these guys are, they just don't fit the bill. So let's start from the top. Tyler Newbin, yay or nay? Answer, yeah, I think so. Six foot two, 210. He's a little bit more sizable. He has an 84 tackling grade and a 70 run defense grade on top of a 90 coverage grade. I mean, you know, if you're into that kind of thing. Cam Kinchins, 58 tackling grade, 69 run defense grade. I'm sorry, I don't think that cuts it. He is, he is what I think you would consider a like pure free safety. Not in Halfley's scheme, mind you, but he's fast and he's good at coverage. Kalen Bullock, 6'3", 190, 71 tackling grade, 49 run defense grade. And to be fair, he has some horrific tackling games. So even though the overall grade is not is a 70, he's got one, two, three, he's got four different games of grades, 40s, 30s, and 20s. So being 190 pounds with a 49 run defense grade, I just don't know that this is the best fit. Javon Bullard, 5'11", 195. 78 tackling grade, 67 run defense grade. It's kind of a meh, and a little bit I doubt it. Cole Bishop, 6'2", 207, 72 tackling grade, 67 run defense grade. It's a kind of a meh, but he's a bigger dude at 6'2", 207. We'll leave him in the maybe pile. Safety Jaden Hicks is 6'3", 212, so he's definitely got the size. However, 66 tackling, 65 run defense. Sorry, no. Dadrian Taylor Demerson is 5'11", 195, 79 tackling, 76 run defense. He's sub 200, but barely. He's sub six foot, but barely. And with a basically 80 tackling grade, 76 run defense grade. Granted, it kind of came out of nowhere. Five years at Texas Tech. He's only had two years where it's been kind of like that, but we'll keep him here. He also grades out fairly well in pass rush. Really consistently solid in coverage. We'll hang on to that. Guy that I liked was Bo Braid. He has a 56 tackling grade. I, I think we'll just let that one slide for now. Sorry. And then there's my guy James Williams, who in my mind immediately went to when I started this whole thing. He's six foot five, 215 pounds. Now, unfortunately, he only has a 67 tackling grade and a 65 run defense grade, and that's consistent with his time at Miami. It has gotten better every single year, but very marginally. I will say to his defense. His coverage grades in three years have been 78, 89, and 86. I'm very tempted to be disingenuous and keep him on here just because I want to. And I've seen him just freaking hit stick people. And since it's my podcast, I'm going to. James Williams stays. (laughs) I don't care. I make up the rules. Then you've got uh, Mr. Jake Shavink's guy, Katan Oladapo. And uh, this guy is probably perfect. I have not watched him yet. I don't... I'm sure I've looked at his PFF because I've done a bunch of mock drafts for my mock draft channel, so I'm sure we've done this before. I don't know that there's a more perfect guy. Um, six foot one, 217 pounds. It's about the biggest guy. I mean, obviously, James Williams is 6'5", but uh, more interested in weight than height. 6'1", 217, 78 tackling grade, 91 run defense grade, 84 coverage grade. Holy good Lord. And he's listed as a strong safety also, which is, I got to just watch this. I mean, is this just the guy? This might just be the guy. We'll do a couple more, but 
I think this is the guy. <laughs> yeah, Sion Vaki. He's uh, six foot 208, 57 run defense. No thank you. Tyke Smith, 5'10", 205. Not terrible, man. He's got 70 uh, tackling, 73 run defense. I'll keep him on here for sure. And then the last two are Malik Mustafa, who's 5'11", uh, 207. 80, 88 run defense, 70 tackling, 72 coverage. I think that's that's fair to stay on the board. And then finally, and obviously there's a lot more safeties, but I'm just doing the top, I don't know, 15 or so. Um, Evan Williams out of Oregon, six foot one, 205. Again, not terrible. I feel like the strong safeties are kind of later on the list. Everybody wants the the rangy, uh, fast guys uh, that are all coverage on the top end. But 73 tackling, 72 run defense, 72 coverage for Evan Williams. Um, also, the last three years, he was at Fresno State prior to this year. 92, 75, and 89 are his pass rush grades. I feel like that's not the worst characteristic. So then the next natural step is to say, how much is Gutekunst going to like these guys on an athletic front, right? I mean, it's it's obviously um, Halfley's defense, but Gut's still got to sign off on the guy. So as far as the RAS goes, Tyler Newbin, um, we're going to have to wait and see because he doesn't have an RAS score, so I'm just going to remove him. Also, it just feels unnecessary, you know, considering we got our top guy to be taken, um, you know, that big of a swing. Malik Mustafa also does not have an RAS grade score. Um, unfortunately, the absolute loser on this list is my guy, James Williams. Uh, very poor explosive grade, very poor speed grade. He ran at a 4.65, which again is not the end of the world, but he still just doesn't check the boxes quite well. Um, Evan Williams was a 6.97. Obviously, that's somewhat acceptable, but not what we're looking for. Tyke Smith was a 7.12. And then there were three. Um, the third best is Mr. Oladapo. He has an 8.23. So I, I really do feel like Oladapo is probably the best option. Now, there is a 9, but, you know, the grade's not quite as good. The middle option would be uh, Dadrian Taylor, uh, Taylor Demerson. He had an 887 RAS, elite speed, running a 441. Um, also had great explosion, 38 inch vert. Bish, uh, excuse me. So Bishop, by the way, had 72 tackling, 67 run defense. Demerson has about an 80 tackling and 76 run defense. So he's kind of he's in the middle of both. He's not as good of a strong safety type as Oladapo. He's not as athletic as Cole Bishop. He's right in the middle. Kind of nice medium there. Um, he's also 5'11", 195, so his lowest, the only thing that kept him from being a 9-something-something RAS is the fact that he's 5 foot, well, our, PFF has 5'11", 195. He me- measured in at 5'10", 197. And then you've got Bishop, who is... Better on size at 6'2", 207. 72 tackling is fine. Um, the 67 run defense would be the lower end of things. However, 981 RAS. So he has, you know, his size is listed as great. 445 speed obviously is is great to have. It's not a negative. And a 39 inch vert. So it really is tough to kind of parse this out. I mean, they they feel relatively equal to me. I mean, on one hand. You got a guy with completely acceptable marks. That, I mean, Cole Bishop's probably my least favorite on this list. I mean, I understand the 981 is nice. Certainly have no objections to an athletic football player on the field. He was a uh, free safety and strong safety, but this past year he was primarily a strong safety. Everything is fine, but again, run defense was a 67, which is decent. And then his worst actually was coverage, which is not great because you're still a safety, you still have to cover. Demerson is goes from like okay to good. He's got 79 overall, 76 run defense, 79 tackling, 91 pass rush, and 76 coverage. Like that's all perfectly fine. He's a little undersized though at 5'11, 195. But athletic. I mean, he's faster than um Bishop is, right? He has a lower RAS because he's smaller. But 441, 38 inch vert, just an inch shy of Cole Bishop's. Inch shy on the uh, the broad jump, honestly, too. But, you know, he's he's not great. He's undersized, but he's athletic and he's he's good. And then you got Oladapo, which just feels right. So, obviously, 
Oladapo dominates on a size standpoint. His size is listed as elite, but that's kind of what made him an eight. His speed was good and his explosion was okay. So the athleticism is lacking the most with Oladapo, but the guy's grades are freaking stupid. 88 overall, 91 run defense, 78 tackling, 67 pass rush. It's a little bit lower, but we're talking 36 attempts here. Most of these guys don't pass rush very often. And then 84 coverage. Either way, of the 15 or so guys we looked at, these are the ones that make the most sense. Strangely enough, Evan Williams did have a 9. I wonder if he had some pro day stuff that went in here. It's weird. When you look on the main page, it's or like an 8-something. And then when you go to the card, it's a 697. So I don't know what happened there. But um, Evan Williams obviously makes the list and is is one of the more enticing ones if the RAS thing checks out. He's at almost a 7, 697, 76, 72, 73, 89, 72. That's his overall defense, run defense, tackling, pass rush coverage. But why don't we take a break? Uh, We'll come back and kind of do a similar thing, I guess, with running backs, at least to the best of what we can. We'll be right back. All right, so as far as running backs, it, you know, and again, this is far from an exact science, but, you know, again, I used to make a joke about Brian Gutekunst that every guy that he wanted to pick up was 5'11", 220. I don't know what it is, 5'11", 220, Gutekunst loves that range. The other thing I, I feel like the Packers maybe want to lean toward a little bit is instead of, I shouldn't say instead of, because all of these attributes are good, elusiveness, whatever, But instead of just being more like quick and shifty, tackle breakers, right? We haven't had tackle breakers. Yards after contact, missed tackles forced, those types of things. So right off the bat, I can tell you right now, Jonathan Brooks is the perfect running back. Jonathan Brooks is 6'2", 216, and he is the most insane back when it comes to guys just falling off of him. He's actually very similar to Josh Jacobs. So that's a no-brainer. That's automatic. Do they want to invest? That high of a pick, which how high, I don't know. We're talking maybe third round, probably second, but supposedly third. Maybe, I don't know. Now, I don't have Jonathan Brooks' RAS, so I don't know where he falls on that. Obviously, he's dealing with an injury, but um, I I don't care. And he's not even 21 years old. I, I cannot tell you how much I like Jonathan Brooks. And I know I'm biased, but I'm telling you, in, in my own little made-up formula, he fits better than anybody else. I can tell you that right now. Anyways, let's find some others. So I did a little bit of the heavy lifting already. I isolated a couple names, went through, found the, all the right height and weights, right? Roughly. Then I filtered out some of the RASs. And just for the record, Estime is somebody to probably put on your radar, but his RAS just wasn't Goody-ish. So I pulled it off. But as far as missed tackles and all that stuff, it's, it's there. And so this one's a little bit tougher because we don't just have grades for missed tackles and all that. So I decided to lean a little bit more on SIS because they have broken tackle plus missed tackle per attempt. And so when you sort by that with the remaining guys, going from least to best, here's what you end up with. Isaac Garendo. Isaac Garendo is six foot one, 225 pounds. He had an 89 PFF grade, 90 rushing grade, 6.1 yards per attempt, and 4.11 yards per uh, after contact per attempt, which is very high. Over four yards per attempt after contact is, is very high. And I think 6'1", 225 is just about perfect. He was actually at Wisconsin for four years and then spent one year at Louisville. So for those of you that are you know, wanting a big Wisconsin guy to come here, this one might be a decent option. Speaking of, the next best option, Braylon Allen. Oh, by the way, before we move on, uh, Isaac Garendo had a 9.97 RAS. His size obviously is great. He ran a 4.33, which is just stupid, along with elite explosion grade and elite agility grades. Braylon Allen is on here because he didn't test, so I don't know what his RAS is, but we'll go with it. Six foot two, 245 pounds. He ran for 5.4 yards per attempt, 3.77 yards after contact per attempt. He was the next highest on the list. He had 21.5% of his rushes resulted in a broken or missed tackle. After that is Trey Benson, 6'1", 223 pounds, 21 years old, 84 PFF grade, 87 rushing grade, at 5.8 yards per attempt, 3.53 yards after contact per attempt. He um, 
was at 21.8%. So Gerendo, 18.9%, Allen, 21.5%, Benson, 21.8%. Trey Benson's RAS was a 9.7. At 6 foot, 216 pounds, that's what he officially weighed in at at the combine, close enough, he ran a 4.39, which I don't have to tell you is stupid. Elite speed, good explosion, good size, 9.7 RAS. After that is Jonathan Brooks, and this is where it becomes a ridiculous jump, and actually there's somebody higher than him, but we went from 19 to 21.5 to 21.8. Now we're going up to 27.4 for Jonathan Brooks. So 6.1 yards per attempt, 92 PFF grade, 92 rushing grade, 3.91 yards after contact per attempt, 27.4% broken plus missed tackle percentage. And again, no RAS for Jonathan Brooks, so I don't know. The top guy here actually is five foot nine, two hundred and twenty pound Marshawn Lloyd. He had an eight five nine RAS, ran a four four six, okay size, good explosion, good speed, seven point one yards per attempt, three point nine seven yards after contact per attempt, had an eighty seven rushing grade. His broken tackle rate was thirty seven percent. So it went from nineteen to twenty one to twenty one to twenty seven to thirty seven for Marshawn Lloyd couple other guys to keep in mind. Um, one of them is Isaiah Davis. SIS doesn't have South Dakota State numbers, but 6.7 yards per attempt, 3.97 yards after contact per attempt. He has 80 missed tackles forced. For reference, a lot of these other guys are in the 60s who have these really high numbers. He's at 80 and a 97 rushing grade. The other one is a guy that really early on I mentioned I really liked, and that's Mayan Williams out of Ohio State. PFF has him listed at 5'9", 226 pounds. Um, 2023 was a wash. It looks like he was injured almost the entire year. But his prior three years, his PFF grades were 92, 86, 89. In 2022, his last healthy year, uh, his only looks like full year, 6.4 yards per attempt, 4.36 yards after contact per attempt, 48 missed tackles forced. And, and by the way, the, the highlight that I put on social media, you can go back and find it on, on Twitter. I'm, I'm guessing I put his name on there, Mayan Williams. So if you search, you can probably find it. Was him just absolutely truck sticking a guy. But if you go back to 2022, and I, I left 2022 and 2023 on here for comparison, Mayan Williams is sixth over the last two years. And he's essentially tied with Jonathan Brooks. Jonathan Brooks, 27.4%. Mayan Williams, 27.3%. Some additional context on the 37.1% for Marshawn Lloyd. That is higher than what Bijan had. Bijan Robinson in 2022 had the second highest for a running back at 36, uh, 30.6%. Also, 2022 Trey Benson had 29.4%. So you can take it or leave it depending on your thoughts on running backs and whatnot, but I, I feel like that's the direction Gutekunst wants to go. And... Um, Even though we have a guy like that, I don't think it's necessarily we need to find some kind of a compliment. I just think it's, this is what I want. And so if I want one of them, I'm going to get one of them. If I want two, I'm going to get two of them. So anyways, I'm going to leave you guys with that. Have a good rest of your day. I will talk to you later. Have a good one. Bye-bye.